Point number seven, the presentation of the policy department study, EU approach on migration in the Mediterranean. We are to hear now from Professor Violeta Moreno Lax, which is a reader at Queen Mary University Law, and Mrs. Lillian Zurdi, Maastricht University, Odysseus Network. They will be presenting the policy department study commissioned by our committee on the EU approach in the Mediterranean, for which Professor Moreno Lax has been the scientific coordinator, and Mrs. Zurdi, one of the co-authors study looking into the developments as to the so-called 2015 refugee crisis, all the way to the COVID-19 pandemic, assessing the effect these events have had on the design, implementation and reform of EU policy on asylum, migration, external border control, and documenting the implications of all of these changes on the actors who operate and are impacted by these policies, including immigration authorities, civil society organizations, and migrants themselves. But this study also includes a review on the state of the play of relevant EU asylum and migration legislation, an appraisal of the situation in the Mediterranean, thorough examination of the external dimension of the EU migration and asylum border policies, focusing on cooperation with third countries taking Turkey, Libya, Niger as case studies, incorporating human rights, refugee law considerations, analysis of the implications of funding allocations under the EU Trust Fund for Africa and the refugee facility for Turkey. So this study is available in the documents that have been circulated for today's meeting as well as in the PowerPoint presentation that Professor Moreno Lax and Mrs. Surdi are about to use for their presentation. We welcome, well, actually, we welcome back. We're happy to welcome back Professor Moreno Lax, who is happily familiar to the works of this Libre Committee for years. She has been quite a contribution whenever we have discussed migration and asylum policies on factual basis, which takes thorough examination. So we're happy to welcome you back, Professor Moreno Lax. If you are there, make yourself visible. We're ready to hear you. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We are delighted to, to be here um, and to present our study, indeed. Uh, next slide, please. As we've said, I'll be taking the floor alongside my colleague, Dr. Lilian Zurdi, although all of my co-authors will be available to answer questions during the Q&A. Next slide, please. The study comprises six substantive chapters that we will present together with the main recommendations at the end. I give now the floor to my colleague. Next slide, please. Thank you, Violetta. We will start with a holistic appraisal of the developments of the migration and asylum policies. Overall, there was limited progress towards a holistic approach to migration as forwarded by the European Parliament in its 2016 resolution. Legal migration policy remains less advanced. For example, the Family Reunification Directive did not succeed in harmonizing member states' practices and the number of EU long-term residence permits issues remained very limited. The new pact largely retains the existing status quo. Next slide, please. In what concerns asylum, overall, we witnessed the limits of legislative harmonization in bringing about uniform standards. Legal entry channels remained limited and discretionary including a lack of harmonization on humanitarian visas, despite the European Parliament's efforts. In the new pact, the main focus is on externalization and the seamless asylum and return border procedures, which are introduced, risk undermining protection. Next slide, please. 
Despite a significant drop in numbers of those arriving and those requesting asylum, crisis discourse and crisis responses persisted. Despite the structural needs of member states, only partial and emergency-driven solidarity measures were adopted, such as, for example, the time-bound intra-EU relocation schemes for the benefit of Greece and Italy. In what concerns the regulatory responses to the pandemic, there were some concerning trends, such as, for example, port closures in Italy or severe limitations on the rights of asylum seekers, specifically the right to freedom of movement in Greece. However, other uh, member states, such as, for example, Portugal, extended uh, visa and residence permits, and more broadly, gradually, we moved from intra-EU border closures to health measures. Next slide, please. In what concerns EU agencies, there we saw the major shifts in the implementation modes of these policies with, uh, for example, the emergence of patterns of joint uh, implementation, such as the joint examination of asylum claims by EASO and Greek authorities. Also, the agency mandates now encompass monitoring-like roles, such as, for example, the vulnerability exercise of Frontex. Increased executive powers for these agencies have meant increased challenges on independence, accountability and respect for human rights. However, existing accountability channels have proven insufficient to counter them. Next slide, please. And I pass the floor back to Violeta moreno lax Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Perfect. Right. So the transition worked. Um, we actually study the criminalization of humanitarian assistance from a wide perspective within um, one of the chapters of, of the study, including not only cases of formal criminal prosecution, but also instances of harassment, intimidation and administrative sanctions levered against citizens, volunteers or NGO staff who assist third country nationals for humanitarian motives. This is an EU-wide phenomenon, but most cases concern Italy and Greece. Although the facilitators package includes an exoneration clause, this is unevenly applied with different member states following different interpretations, which is something that the new Commission guidance does not resolve. This situation undermines the role of NGOs as human rights defenders, disregards the human rights of third country nationals, fosters mistrust in public authorities and erodes EU values as per Article 2 of the EU Treaty. Next slide, please. Nonetheless, Criminalization has increased dramatically since 2015, with COVID-19 exacerbating the problem. Out of the 28 rescue vessels active in the Mediterranean since the refugee crisis, 18 of them have at some point been impounded. The latest data indicates that there are 60 active cases, at least, where formal charges have been brought against 171 individuals, in 13 member states on a variety of charges. Our study reveals that even when proceedings are discontinued, criminalization has a chilling effect and discourages life-saving work like the one performed by the search and rescue organizations. There are also indications that the criminalization of humanitarian assistance is being exported as a model to third countries with which the EU and the member states cooperate. Next slide, please. This is all the more problematic if we take account of international and EU obligations. The duty to assist persons in distress and disembark them at a place of safety in line with human rights, including the principle of non-refoulement, is an obligation under international and EU law on all captains of all vessels that applies 
everywhere at sea, regardless of the status, nationality, and other circumstances of the persons concerned. The obligation begins from the very moment there is knowledge from any source that somebody is in danger of being lost. And coastal states have, in addition, the obligation to establish rescue services and rescue facilities to respond effectively to distress calls and coordinate rescue operations. Next slide, please. The EU's response, however, has left much to be desired, particularly because rescue is wrongly characterised as a pull factor, despite the lack of evidence in this regard. Regardless of the high number of deaths, counting 20,000 since 2015, there is no integrated rescue response in the Mediterranean. What is more, both Frontex and the Uniformed have been accused of involvement in and facilitation of human rights violations, including pushbacks. Member states, too, have engaged in refoulement practices in cooperation with third countries such as Turkey and Libya. The new rescue recommendation by the European Commission attempts to address some of these issues, but it risks shrinking rather than expanding rescue capacities by subjecting NGOs to obstructive scrutiny instead of providing for a European integrated response. And the compulsory relocation system foreseen in the new pact is too complex and too fragmented to provide a real solution. Next slide, please. Cooperation with third countries encompasses rescue and interdiction at sea, but not only. The focus is on the containment of irregular migration by preventing departures through informal soft law instruments. This strategy entails rule of law risks, since there is no or very little involvement of the European Parliament, no judicial oversight and a structural impossibility to guarantee compliance with human rights. In the study, we focused on cooperation with Turkey, Libya and Niger to guide the analysis. Our main findings are that in all three cases, cooperation has led to a deterioration of human rights and a problematic disregard of local dynamics and the interest of the partner country in a way that undermines the objectives pursued. Next slide, please. External funding has been channeled through the Facility for Refugees in Turkey and the EU Trust Fund for Africa, both of which are based on EU development cooperation and humanitarian aid policy. However, funded projects fail to comply with the main aims of these policies, which are poverty reduction and relief of populations hit by disasters, rather than migration management and the reduction of flows to Europe. They are implemented without due consideration for the local context and their impact on the rights of their country nationals. Therefore, the current approach risks weakening the EU's reputation and our relations with external partners, ultimately impeding any real impact on the root causes of migration in the long term. Next slide, please. In light of this, the team has formulated 45 recommendations to the Parliament, including to revise the new PAC proposals for alignment with human rights and the principle of solidarity, the introduction of a mechanism for independent monitoring of rescue and interdiction activities in the Mediterranean, as well as their criminalisation, the deployment of a permanent and sufficient EU rescue capacity, complementing private efforts by NGOs and private shipping companies, the full de decriminalisation of humanitarian assistance, the introduction of a comprehensive compliance system for all external actions impacting on migration, including above all, human rights suspension clauses and excluding migration management conditionality. We also recommend that, a new, that new accountability mechanisms are introduced in all relevant instruments, reserving a meaningful role for the European Parliament. And finally, we recommend the European Parliament to make full use of its budgetary and litigation powers to pursue compliance with human rights, institutional balance and the division of competences foreseen in the treaties. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to your questions.
It's us to thank you, Professor Moreno Lex and Dr. Zurdi, for this most enlightening piece of study on the policy department regarding a uh, key issue, so core of our concerns as migration policies in the Mediterranean and the situation as it stands. So we thank you. Please stay in tune because we are to open up now the round of speakers in the speaking list for discussion and then we will be hearing more of you. We get started now with the EPP first speaking listed person, which is Lena Dupont again for the EPP. There you go for the next couple of minutes. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks to the panelists uh, for, for their not only introduction, but the work they had done on the study um, itself. I think, as it has been highlighted already by, by uh, the contribution, we are here right in the middle of the new pact of, on asylum and migration and the current negotiations we also have here in the Parliament. And of course, it's um, also good to have um, to have a broad overview of the impact the pandemic had on uh, certain elements of this, uh, not of the package, but of the um, of the legislative basis in in question. Um, we are all aware that there's progress is urgently needed. We still um, we are looking forward for the discussion uh, also tomorrow on the Malta declaration and the, the possibility of reviving it. Um, but I think we also all have in mind that not only due to the rising numbers of arrivals on our shore, but also given to the tense situation around the European Union with the neighbouring countries, uh, we still need, urgently need um, um, progress with the packet um, as, as a whole. And to conclude, or maybe to just as a, just a general outline, our aim is, is of utmost importance here is so working together closely with third countries preventing people from taking these dangerous journeys and routes uh, and improving sustainable living condition. Given that the Mediterranean itself is already a quite complex, we are all aware of that complex environment. So we know that there will be no one fits all ap approach or solution, but I nevertheless think that also taking into consideration the action of third countries and the uh, negotiations with third countries are still key to the whole package. Um, as a whole, making use of all instruments available to us, especially uh, when it comes to external relations and the collaboration with third countries like the visa leverage that the Council just concluded. So uh, here again also it's good that the Council started reviewing and discussing the relationships, especially uh, with a focus to Turkey, of course carefully, but well needed uh, to improve the situation of those uh, 3.7 million Syrians already in Turkey. And um, coming to the, the remarks and the um, proposals you made uh, in the study, um, I would like to group, let's say, three questions um, also based on what you had said. So what kind of support would be needed to improve the cooperation with third countries in line with human rights um, uh, obli obligation, especially seeing the current development and the movement in the Council as regards Turkey, uh, since it's also part of the pact and crucial for the functioning of the whole system, what advice would you give on the effective and consistent return policy? And the last question, um, picking up something you had said on the border procedure, which is indeed crucial to the, to the package as a whole. Um, it's here again a question of how it is designed um, in order to ensure fundamental rights um, adherence and guarantees. So a question back to you. How could it be done uh, so that it is in full respect of fundamental rights? And also touching on what you had said on, uh, as regards legal migration, uh, maybe you can give us a short uh, comment on the current proposals on the talent partnership and the talent partner, uh, the talent pool, because we're now working on it as well. Thanks. Thank you. Now it will be Dominique Ricevesa for S&D. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman Juan Fernando López Aguilar. And thank you, above all, um, to, the, um, uh, to the authors of this study, which I think it's a very, it's a, it's a very sobering study, and I will say also very damning study, 
for current EU policies, uh, and by EU I mean also uh, and above all member, state, uh, member states' policies on migration and asylum. Uh, I think uh, the, this study confirms what we, uh, in a way, uh, many of us, I think, in this House already knew about uh, how um, we are uh, falling short in, in so many dimensions when it comes to this topic. Um, it's unfortunately, it's not the only recent report reaching such dire conclusions. The latest study of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Rights Michel, Michel Bachelet, uh, also comes down in a very, I will say, similar, if not identical line. And of course, uh, this, uh, this failing has to do uh, with many things, but certainly with uh, following the far right in a way, or, 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 or you know, uh, falling prey to the far right rhetoric of uh, seeing migration not as a phenomenon that has to be managed, and to some extent also uh, an opportunity, but uh, as a threat. So the priority is to, to keep people out as much as possible, by any means possible, whether it's using an acoustic cannon in Greece or building fences and walls in other uh, borders or uh, sending asylum applicants to African countries. Um, but uh, it is also clear from this presentation that uh, even the new proposal, the new pact, the so-called bombastically called new pact on migration and asylum fails to structurally embed fair sharing of responsibility. Of course, again, the Commission thinks that the solution is not to ensure uh, fair uh, responsibility sharing for arrivals, but to offer those that don't want to, to be uh, solidaristic, uh, to offer them to pay uh, for uh, returns. Another you know, a big priority to ensure as many returns as possible. Um, so maybe the authors can further develop their assessment on, on the, the failings of the pact, which I share. Then we have the problem of uh, still not having search and rescue. And of course, uh, it's interesting to see how the, how the study confirms that uh, having search and rescue resources do not act as a poll factor and th that the right to live takes precedence in any case. And we from S&D have repeatedly called for an EU uh, uh, SAR scheme. And uh, then we have, of course, the problems with Frontex, but Frontex wants more money from us. Huh? They want more money, more money, more money from the EU budget, but we don't see uh, accountability. We see Mr. Legeri is still there. He has not resigned. He doesn't want to resign. And the responsibility for the, the very clear cases of cooperation of Frontex with human rights violations in Greek waters and other places. So uh, what, what are your um, recommendations uh, regarding uh, Frontex? Also because they don't seem to be uh, willing to focus on search and rescue, to the contrary, to move away also as much as possible from search and rescue. So I think the, uh, the, the reality in front of us is, is, really, is really not good at all, and we need, I think, a radical shift in how we manage asylum and migration in Europe, building up a positive uh, narrative and uh, fighting the frame that the far right has created and that many you know, fellow pro-Europeans are, are falling in, including from, very surprising to me, from the Christian democratic tradition. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Now it will be Fabian Keller for Renew. Fabian, you are there. You have the parole. Monsieur le Président. Chairman, thank you very much. I wish to thank the authors of this study sincerely. I think you have provided us with a very detailed and useful study in the way you've set out and analysed the data. It's very, very 
clear and it clearly shows up the weaknesses of European asylum policy and the dynamics that exist between the different actors, stakeholders and countries involved. And you clearly say that reform is not something that can be avoided. It's unavoidable in this reshaping of asylum policy and that is now going through the European Parliament. I wish to thank you for the precise recommendations that you make, which uh, provide us very good basis for our work. Now, there are two topics I would like to raise, and the sound cuts out, <coughs> relating to the reform of the Migration Pact. The sound is intermittent. We relating to rescue at sea. Um, the position there is blocked and the declaration, the Malta declaration is very clear on this, but we expect a new position to be adopted soon with more countries backing that and we will be discussing this at the mini plenary session. I wondered what the impact will be on the ground. The, the sound is intermittent. Um, now, my second question relating to trafficking rings that uh, encourage people to risk their lives. Of course, that crackdown needs to be uh, made much more robust and structured. What would be your assessment of current efforts to uh, counter the activities of traffickers and what uh, precise recommendations would you make in this regard? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and also thanks a lot to uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, moreno Lex and uh, Tsudi for their comprehensive work. I mean, the title says uh, EU approach on the migration in the Mediterranean, but it's much more broader, actually, and I think it's, it's very worthwhile that we have an overview of uh, the current challenges, uh, also on legal migration, the pact, and the external dimension that you rightly so put so much emphasis on. Um, uh, I have um, uh, one very detailed question on family unification, because you rightly say the, we, we cannot expect a lot of new legislation over there, and there are reasons for it, but at the same time, we see a very grave type of discrimination uh, between beneficiaries of international protection under the Refugee Convention and beneficiaries of subsidiary protection. Um, and um, this, is, this is made possible due to the Family Unification Directive. Do you see a possibility for us as co-legislators to correct this uh, gap through amend amending the qualification directive, for instance. I mean, with, with, a, with a reference to the Family Unification Directive. The Commission does the same in this new pact, for instance, by uh, reducing the term for long-term residence status to three years in the AMMR and not in the Long-Term Residence uh, Directive. Furthermore, on the new pact, I think I agree with you that, uh, uh, that, that we see that what the main problem is actually the lack of enforcement of, uh, uh, of compliance with the current rules that we have. And we don't have any reason to think that also with the new pact there will be a different compliance and enforcement policies. At the same time, we see uh, that the first entry criteria is still in the new pact proposals. Now, I'm afraid that um, the whole negotiations, again, will distract from the need to enforce compliance. What would you think, actually, that uh, we would better stick to the current rules and put pressure on compliance, then start negotiating on a new uh, uh, pact, of which we have to see if it will be complied with at all? And uh, here, I think the European Parliament can call and call time and time again for enforcement policies. But what could we do more? Could you envisage a possibility, for instance, for failure to act uh, a procedure by the European Parliament? Maybe just thinking out of the box or whatever, uh, because you call for using the position as a parliament, rightly so. Also regarding the criminalization of search and rescue and humanitarian aid, Shouldn't we also more treat it as a rule of law issue and then use the tools that we have in order to, uh, 
to, uh, to, to protect civil society against these tendencies. My last point is about externalization. And I, I concur completely with a lot of your recommendations. And, uh, well, happily so, uh, a lot of them have been already adopted also by the European Parliament in our report on the uh, human rights aspects of uh, the externalization of asylum and migration policies, uh, which was uh, presented uh, in the Droit Committee and adopted a few weeks ago in the plenary. So that's a very good news, but now it's up to the implementation again. Uh, and the Parliament so called for human rights impact assessment, monitoring, better scrutiny of uh, the funding and so on. Um, and, and I think maybe also this shows, this study here and the discussion that we have here shows that there should be a much stronger cooperation between LIBE and AFET on this issue. I mean, here we talk about returns, but we never talk about the cooperation with third countries on combating irregular migration. And that's odd, because here we have the people engaged and, and, and with knowledge on uh, those migration and asylum issues. But maybe you could reflect a little bit on what we could do more in order to really implement what we have already uh, adopted in the plenary. For instance, on monitoring, if the Commission doesn't do it, would there be any uh, a way to also um, uh, initiate own uh, uh, um, uh, practices, network, monitoring exercises uh, or uh, other uh, uh, initiatives, what you think of. And my last question, because Libya, it's, it's really, it's, it's a really a, a big shame for the EU, of course, that we finance pulling back people to situations where the human rights are, are flagrantly violated. Um, um, uh, we have to do more, of course, uh, everything that we can. But I would also like to hear from you, is there any, there is litigation ongoing. What are your expectations uh, uh, on that, in that area? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now it will be for ID Peter Kofford. Thank for the foreman. Man will you have to hold Nick. Thank you, Chair. Well, it's difficult to know what to say or believe when you enter the European Parliament and have to listen to what I have to listen to every day. It can really take your spirits down. We're six years on from the big refugee crisis. It's been almost six years since the European borders were inundated. One and a half million people crossed the borders. I was in Padborg, one of the Danish border cities, and saw how the Danish border was just run underfoot by all these people. And the feeling was that the EU system just couldn't cope. They didn't know what to do. That a majority of politicians in Copenhagen had just given up, didn't know what they want to do. And people were scared. They were really afraid. What's happening? This is Denmark. And the only answer now, even six years later, is that what's not working is even more political correctness, just more blah, blah, more talking about human rights, international conventions, while our borders are just as open as could be. I'm shocked, to be honest. Our point of departure is completely wrong for this and in this hout. We can't just accept immigration. That can't be our point of departure and open the borders completely to people from Africa and the Middle East. I think the point of departure should be that we are protecting our borders. We are protecting ourselves and our countries. But it's a completely different point of departure inside the system. And here I can see my colleagues are now shaking their heads and rolling their eyes. Do! Please do continue doing that. But I am shocked that this is the situation in Europe. It is very far away from reality as perceived by people outside. I am shocked, but I still have a question. Because a colleague said that um, immigration is just an enrichment. So to the wise people who wrote the report, where in Europe has mass immigration from Africa and the Middle East been fantastic? Where has it led to economic surplus? Where has it led to joy? 
diversity, more love between peoples. Where has mass immigration been a success? I only see problems when I look at this continent. I see problems that make people furious and worried. Please tell me, where is it that your immigration has worked? What is it you would point to when say, we are so proud of this new Europe that you have helped create it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'll work to look to shut down the outer borders. I will work to ensure that Denmark can have a very stringent immigration policy because we don't want to experience what Sweden, Germany or France has had. It really scares me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Koffel. We move to Peter, uh, Jorge Busade, the SR, por favor. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you very much, Indy Chairman. To a large extent, I can agree to what the previous speaker said just now. The current wave of managing migration in Europe just isn't working now. You know, we've got thousands of people arriving in certain places and causing social emergencies in Ceuta and Melilla, for example. And if you look at the reports on arrivals of illegal migrants, then you've got an increase of 51.6%. And we had a 100% increase just one year ago, and we've got 126% increase for my own country. So clearly, we can declare the European policy on migration a failure. And it cannot be simply summed up as a way of sharing out equally the migrants that arrive amongst member states. It's, but more than that, it's simply about uh, denying the reality that hundreds and thousands of people are living with on a daily basis in Spain and elsewhere. The fact is that maintaining a young migrant arriving in Europe costs 4,700 euros per month. And at the same time, you have widows living on an income of 500 euros per month. The figures speak for themselves. That's the reality. And when these figures continue to exist, you can either keep trotting out the same mantras as people do in this parliament, or you can work on building a, an effective policy. Now, all these patches we have are trying to save the system as a whole rather than reforming it from the ground up. We can't agree to this kind of system that sanctions illegal migration. So why, I ask, do we not question the complicity of NGOs in illegal human trafficking in the Mediterranean? Why do we not act with uh, firmness against these bodies that are using European funds for this, to these ends? Why do we not put an end to this effect which calls people, invites people into dangerous situations to seek better life in Europe? Or is that not the case? Or perhaps there are interests at stake here. Now, we have abandoned a situation, an idea that was floated in 2016, the idea of setting up regional um, centres in um, peripheral countries around the EU, in Libya and elsewhere, allowing for migrants to seek legal routes for migration at the country of origin, on, not uh, in European territory, because the returns um, decisions are working ever less effectively. Left, Miguel Urban Crespo. I don't think he's connected. He's not connected. Then it will be Malin Bjork. Malin, you are connected. Yes, you are. Yes, yes, I am here. I'm here. Thank you very much, Chair. 
And I think uh, the last two speakers actually uh, show that what we have to deal with also in, in this house and in our different countries is that uh, there are political forces that uh, don't uh, want, they want to work in a way that as if international commitments and human rights laws didn't even exist. They are uh, experts, experts in pinning people against each other, whether that be, you know, older people or, or, or school kids against uh, uh, immigration. And uh, they're also prepared, the same political forces are prepared to dismantle the rule of law, democracy and human rights within Europe. So I think we should be very wary about their uh, their narrative and about their demands. I must say that I find this um, piece of research very useful, especially as we now will enter into very critical uh, lines of negotiations on some of the main files that is part of the proposal for a new migration pact. Uh, and I think it sheds light on some of the most important parts that, that it makes it up. If I just say something about the issue of, of um, uh, humanitarian assistance and the criminalization, I think this is something where we have seen a, a very eroding space for civil society, and especially, of course, in terms of search and rescue in the Mediterranean, but also in other, other countries which don't have a, a sea, uh, uh, and where we see that uh, organizations that work on human rights and uh, on migrant rights, but also on women's rights and LGBTI rights, are being increasingly um, persecuted. Uh, and I think this has to be addressed. And if you are uh, very clear, I would like to, to also uh, ask you to develop uh, in which ways the Commission recommendation is, uh, or guidelines are insufficient and what we need to possibly even as legislators address uh, in order to change this. Another issue that I wanted to raise is, of course, the issue of externalization. And the fact is that as we become uh, more, if we do persecution of, of uh, human rights uh, defenders and search and rescue operations by, by uh, NGOs in Europe, then of course what that will happen and that will be, be also um, propagated to other countries. And this is very, very um, important uh, conclusions that you make. And I would be interested to hear more about that if you, if you have some more uh, information to give us. And then, then uh, uh, finally, um, you ask us uh, that, that, and I think also the other parts of, of, the, of the study is, of course, extremely useful as we go into the negotiations on the border procedures, on the screening, uh, and if you have more information to give us on, on that and, and your views, that is also very, very welcome. You know that the draft reports will be presented uh, by the different rapporteurs mid-September. We still have time so that this piece of work can inform the work that the Parliament is doing as a legislative uh, co-legislator in this field. Uh, and and uh, I must uh, also ask you then, so that's to give us some, some input on the legislative side. And then also you mentioned that you would like to see the European Parliament more active in, in litigation, but also in, in budgetary powers. And, and uh, do, do, uh, uh, do feel free to develop that also for us in this committee meeting. Uh, thank you very much for, for this very useful piece of work. Thank you. Okay, and now it'll be Laura Ferrara for Nolan Scree. Are you there? Laura Ferrara, see. Si. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation of this very important study, which flags up once again many critical aspects relating to European immigration policy. Migration policy. Now, these critical elements we had hoped would have been overcome also with the new pact on migration and asylum. Now, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I do think once again these matters will not be resolved. We were hoping for a more ambitious proposal from the Commission. We said it again and again. Maybe politically the time isn't yet right, but historically Realistically, it really is the time to start talking about a new European right to asylum or European asylum law because there's, it's not enough just to try to align or harmonize the laws across the EU and in any case we're still far from seeing adequate implementation. So maybe starting to talk about a real European asylum law or right to asylum might be the best long-term way forward to make sure we have a true European 
policy for migration? Because I think today the only point that the member states seem to agree on is the external dimension of migration. In other words, externalizing the management to third countries. I don't want to repeat what my colleagues have already said, some of my colleagues. I wanted to focus on two main points. First of all, how do you consider that in practice Article 80 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU can actually be implemented? It's often cited, particularly when we talk about cooperation and distribution of responsibilities across the member states, also financially, in managing migratory flows. But for the time being, it just seems to be principle, a question of principle that isn't applied in practice. So how to actually flesh out and apply Article 80? My second question, if we were once again to arrive at a situation of an impasse and the lack of political will to arrive at a solution that all member states can go along with. What is a plan B in that case? What if this just drags on and on, these negotiations and debates, will that carry on forever? Or is there some kind of plan B, another proposal up our sleeves? If you allow me, Professor Moreno Lax and Dr. Zurdi, we will complete the list of members which are willing to discuss, because I have a secondary list, a second round of speakers. If you allow me, it will be one minute each, so that we can have some time for your reactions and responses, because there have been quite many questions being raised already by now. It will be Cyrus Engerer. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the uh, academics who have given us such an interesting perspective from uh, their study that really sheds interesting light onto the work that we do uh, in this house and in the other institutions of this European Union. But I, I had a, a speech ready, however, I, I, I have to make some comments on what I have heard today because what takes my spirits down, to quote other colleagues in this room, is someone believing that discussing human rights is blah blah. But I must agree that I too am not proud of the new Europe that we're living in. I too believe that this new Europe is not something that we wish for because it has become a European Union of a stalemate when it comes to migration. Since 2015, I, I, even before that, but I was going to mention the holistic approach to migration in the Mediterranean um, report released by the Commission in 2015. Since then, that called for effective solidarity mechanism. Since then, we have seen the first emergency relocation scheme for Italy and Greece in 2015, the second emergency relocation scheme for the increase of migratory flows, permanent relocation mechanism that had been withdrawn in 2019, hotspots, reform of Dublin, European Agency on Migration, a new compact on migration, and finally, new pact on migration and asylum. But when you go to the, in fact, when you go to the audiovisual website of the European Parliament itself and you search for how many times this topic has been discussed, it has been discussed 59 times. And yet it is still stuck at Council with a number of member states believing that discussing human rights is blah blah and that we shouldn't move on. We should simply stop all that um, we are discussing. And what do, what, what should we do then? Should we allow these boats that are, I mean, not all member states at the end of the day have a border with another member states. Some member states have the sea that surrounds them. What should we do? Leave these human beings on these dinghies to drown? Is that the blah blah that we're discussing? Because it, it, it has simply taken me aback. I remember the in 2015, the, discussing the Kianga report, report in this house on holistic approach to migration in the Mediterranean. And yet, unfortunately, even when I, I, I went through the report, I think that we need to also address the elephant in the room, which is uh, the way that political actions are being used in council um, in order not to move forward on a number 
of files that at the end of the day are not only important because in reality everything is important but these are files that actually discuss the lives of human beings and what else is there more important uh, than that so um, my my original question was going to be uh, on um, on issues pertaining to the litigation that the European Parliament should go into as um, advocated by, by the researchers and maybe they could give us some more light on that. But how do you do that in the sense if you have a council of ministers of the European Union that is not respecting uh, the treaty, even when uh, in discussing migration, because it is many a times going to unanimity rather than quality, qualified majority voting, um, and um, the Commission permitting this. Um, how, in the grander scheme of things, how do, how do you see this? Thank you very much. Try to refrain, please, because we will be having a joint venture with the Cont and Budget Committee right afterwards concerning Frontex, which will certainly be quite an endeavour for the members of the Liberal Committee. But I still have Jean-Christophe Otien. Are you there, connected? Can you make it and make it short, please? Sure, I do, uh, dear Chair. But uh, honestly, if you don't cut the people, uh, they will talk forever. Uh, so, uh, um, well, um, I would. Uh, I have just three short questions. Uh, first question is concerning uh, um, legal migration. And I agree with you that we don't focus enough on uh, legal migration. Um, do you agree that uh, without um, thinking labor migration in the context of migration and asylum, uh, we do, will not find a balanced uh, solution or a balanced approach um, uh, on migration? And what would your, be your concrete proposals uh, for labor migration and for um, legal humanitarian um, uh, migration, for example, uh, visas? Second question is um, uh, concerning uh, EASO. Do you think that uh, the approach that has been taken by EASO and Greece to uh, jointly um, do asylum applications is the best way forward in order to have um, a same approach in the uh, different member states. And my third question is concerning uh, Libya. Um, what would be your solution uh, in the cooperation with Libya, or uh, should we not have any um, cooperation uh, with Libya at all in, um, um, in respect of uh, human rights? Thank you. Thank you. Now, please, Professor Moreno Lax and Dr. Tsudi, the floor goes back to you. You organize yourselves. You choose who is going to make it first and then second, but please try to maybe three, four minutes each maximum because we are lagging behind and we still have a point to go through before the joint meeting with budget and cont. That goes to you, Professor Monalax. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm going indeed first. I'm going to select the key points that I think are um, the ones require most attention and pass the floor to, to Dr. Zurdi. So in terms of how to improve our support to third countries, um, I think there are two elements that we put forward in the report that would be going into this direction. The comprehensive compliance system um, that includes a number of elements like undertaking risk assessments, introducing monitoring, reporting and evaluation mechanisms as well as a human rights suspension clause uh, would be a step in the right direction. Accepting that human rights binds the EU and the member states in everything they do, both internally and externally. And this is not me interpreting. It's Article 51 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights read in light of the treaties. Um, we would also need to acknowledge and deal with the internal impact of external cooperation. And I'm thinking of um, the impact that the EU-Turkey statement has had on Greece and Cyprus, or the impact that cooperation with Libya is having on Italy and Malta, for example. It is also important that we do recognize that there are internal after effects of our external relations, and we need a system that uh, considers this and assigns responsibility equitably among all member states rather than overburdening coastal member states. The principle of solidarity since Lisbon needs to be structurally embedded 
in everything the European Union does within all aspects of immigration, border and asylum policy. And this hasn't been done. The Dublin principle of the country of first entry needs to be abandoned. It is a principle that predates not only Lisbon, but also Amsterdam. It was inherited from the Schengen Cooperation. It made it into the 90s Dublin um, Convention, but it is obsolete and it cannot be maintained. In terms of rescue and the fact that it doesn't constitute a pull factor, uh, we do show in the report that indeed crossings track sea and weather conditions and patterns of surveillance. And even if it was a pull factor, which we do demonstrate it is not, search and rescue at sea is a legal and ethical obligation. It is not optional. It is really beyond discussion whether we should or shouldn't engage in search and rescue. The European Union, for the time being, is at fault of not complying with its own obligations in this regard. Remember that the EU as a whole, as well as all the member states, have ratified the UN Convention on, Law, on the Law of the Sea and the Maritime Conventions. So um, one element that I think shows very well this lack of a correlation between rescue and a pull factor is that during lockdown in 2020, between March and June, when there weren't any search and rescue NGOs active in the Mediterranean, there was a peak in arrivals. So this is something that we should consider and keep in mind. Frontex, and there were some questions on this, needs to also comply with all its obligations, including, including human rights obligations, and accountability channels need to improve in this regard. We do recommend that this is enhanced. One idea could be to st structuralize the European Parliament Working Group on Frontex, that it's currently active. But it needs to be clear that effective border control and effective migration management needs to adjust and embed uh, human rights. Why? Because it's not blah, blah, blah from the legal perspective. The Charter of Fundamental Rights and Compliance with Human Rights is above politics and ideology. Remember that the European Union is not a state, it is an international organisation that needs to act within the powers conferred on it and in line with the rules found in the founding treaties. So we might not like the human rights provisions they're in, but non-compliance would require treaty reform. Human rights are a constitutional, a constitutional requirement, so it is important that we bear this into account. Um, in terms of um, how to implement Article 80 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the right to asylum, and I'm looking at the clock, so I only have 30 more seconds, uh, and how to deal with trafficking rings that um, um, uh, the member, uh, uh, the MEP Fabian Keller has mentioned, encourage people to cross and embark in dangerous journeys. I would say that um, trafficking rings or, or smuggling um, mafias are not really the ones responsible for encouraging persons across borders. And the push factors are the ones that need to be acknowledged in this regard and that need to be taken in consideration in policy design. The fact that there aren't any channels for legal access to seek asylum in the European Union is one important factor. And so a way to operationalize Article 18 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and at the same time have an impact on uh, the trafficking and smuggling ranks that we despise would be to um, put again on the table the humanitarian visa initiative that this uh, House already proposed during the last legislature. In terms of... Um, Pressure on compliance. We have recommended indeed that the European Parliament could engage more actively in litigation and make use of its powers to, for example, request uh, or reprimand the European Commission or the Council when they fail to act or when they do act in a manner that is incompatible with the division of powers and competencies allocated in the treaties. Recourse to soft law, for example, it's in breach of the provisions in Articles 216, 218 and others in the TFEU. And we do think there is scope for the European Parliament to reclaim that instead of soft law instruments, legal and legally binding instruments um, following the legislative procedure foreseen in the treaties are followed in relations with third countries. In terms of the criminalisation of humanitarian assistance, I do think that the idea that this is linked to a rule of law issue, it's indeed 
So we do highlight this in chapter five of the study. There is a need to protect search and rescue NGOs as human rights defenders, and we propose that the EU and UN framework is used to protect defenders that act inside the European Union rather than only outside. A monitoring mechanism, I think, could be implemented initiated or sponsored by the European Parliament in the form of a network, a tool, whatever we think that might be best, to not only monitor criminalization, but also certain rescue and interdiction activity, as well as cooperation with third countries that would undermine the human rights of third country nationals. I pass the floor now to my colleague. Yes, very briefly, uh, I would like to address some f uh, further points that were raised. First of all, on the talent partnerships, uh, where should one focus? I would say uh, on a genuine commitment to legal access. So previous uh, such efforts actually uh, consisted of non-numerically uh, significant access opportunities. So I would say to really place the emphasis on numbers in order to make this significant. On border uh, procedures, uh, asylum and return in the new pact, I would say that apart uh, from the procedural safeguards uh, that need to be placed in the design of the law, one must not forget also their intrinsic link with uh, reception conditions and with the conditions uh, that asylum seekers find themselves uh, at uh, border areas. I'm thinking uh, of the current situation in uh, the islands of Eastern Aegean. So any such system should also see uh, and, and factor in uh, the financial, the operational dimensions uh, and the reception conditions for asylum uh, seekers. Addressing uh, the issue uh, of the family reunification directive and the differentiation uh, between subsidiary protection beneficiaries through the qualification directive seems to be an excellent idea. In the past, uh, this was happening through positive practice of member states, but since 2015, we have seen significant backtracking. So I do believe that this is an issue that should be legislated, and this is uh, a very fruitful avenue. ONEASO and its involvement in uh, joint uh, processing, yes, it, it does uh, have, it is a way forward on achieving uh, harmonization of practices, but it should be uh, embedded with procedural safeguards and procedural guarantees. The current pact instruments do not reflect this increased operational role of agencies in uh, processing. So this is something that the parliament uh, should uh, follow closely. And finally, what is the plan B if uh, the legislation, this legislative initiative does not move forward? Uh, can we stay only uh, on enforcing what we have? I would say that the big problem there is the structural solidarity deficit that exists in the current uh, design. So any uh, such plan B should find also uh, practical ways and whatever wiggle room uh, exists then to address this structural solidarity deficit. But indeed, uh, the most sustainable uh, way forward would be uh, a redesign uh, which uh, embeds uh, solidarity structurally. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Marina Lax and Dr. Churdi, for your work and presentation and for the discussion and for your efforts to summarize the answers to the question raised. Being divisive issues certainly are of the interest, of the concern of the members of the Labour Committee, but we only expect to be seeing more of you, hearing more of you. Okay, thank you again. Now we should move on.